Hello, welcome to KubeCon 2021. Today's topic is disaster recovery, the ability to recover from a full data center loss, making sure you have the data and can recover your application. My name is Orit Wasserman. I'm OP Chief Data Foundation Architect at Red Hat. And with me today is my colleague, Sham Wang Fan from Red Hat, who is also an architect in the storage team. Today, we will go over the foundation of disaster recovery and then talk about storage application in Kubernetes. Then Sean will go over to multi-cluster management, recovery, relocate, and orchestration. Then we'll have a short demo and talk about our future work. The demo will be based on Ceph with a software-defined storage completely open source, quite mature. The idea behind Ceph is installing the Ceph software on standard servers, start using standard disk from HDD to NVMe to persistent memory, and using standard IP network, get a real very reliable, highly available, very scalable distributed storage system. In a single step cluster, you get all your storage need, you get cloud object storage with Redis Gateway, block storage from RBD, and CephFS will provide you with distributed file system. In order to deploy Ceph in Kubernetes, we are going to use Rook, a CNCF graduated project. Uh, it manage Ceph, you can manage Ceph, deploy it, configure it, activate advanced features like disaster recovery and replication using basic Kubernetes resources, operators, and custom resource definition. Let's talk about disaster recovery. Disaster recovery is making sure we can serve our customers even if we lose a data center or a cloud region. And sadly, this can happen. On the left, for example, we have a photo of OVH, one of the largest data centers in Europe that com was completely destroyed by fire last year. In most cases, our disaster recovery site should be far, and that will mean high network latency. In that case, we won't be able to use synchronous application, but asynchronous, which means we don't finish to the right, we don't wait for the right to sync. And that will mean there will be some data loss in case of recovery. If you can maintain low enough network latency and can use synchronous application, then we can even get high availability. We, in this talk, we're going to focus on regional DR, which means two separate remote sites with high network latency two separate Kubernetes cluster, two separated storage systems. In case we can stretch the storage system, this we sometimes refer as metro DR or zonal DR. Two very important way we measure the disaster recovery are RPO and RTO. Recovery point objective is the amount of acceptable data loss in case of recovery from disaster. It's measured in time unit. Recovery time objective is the amount of time that the application can be done uh, before it will impact the business. Again, measured in minutes. So what is the ideal disaster recovery? We want the RPO, the amount of data we lose, to be as low as possible. Minutes, no more. We want to reduce the RTO, the amount of time it takes us to recover from, the, from when we detected the disaster. And it will be much easier if you can have a single plane of glass to orchestrate the fell over and fell back. Much better user experience. Example is Ceph. We can Ceph regional DR. We have two clusters, West and East. Each has their own Rook Ceph deployments. We are using Ceph uh, Geo application. In this example, RBD async snap mirroring that is based on snapshot. And we have the PVs active and writable in cluster West. And they are standby 
replicated to cluster East. We can have two ways of replication, which meaning East can be a standby to West and West can be a standard to East, much more efficient use of resources. And in that case, we can support up to minutes of RPO and few minutes of RTO. So what would happen in our Kubernetes cluster when we have a region failure? In that case, we will recover to the East region. This is done without any cooperation from the storage and the Kubernetes cluster in West. We will promote forcefully the PVs and make them primary and writable in cluster East, making them unavailable in cluster West. But we may have some data loss. When you want to recover back or relocate back to cluster West, in this case, we don't want to have data loss. And in this case, we'll actually have both regions participating in the relocation operation. Cluster West will resync with Cluster East, catch up. Then the application and the PV will be down in Cluster East, making sure all the data is synchronous to the source system. Cluster West will take only the latest changes and then will make the previous farming again and writable and the application in cluster ways without any data loss. So let's talk about storage application. First, why can't we use backup? So backup are great, very important. You should backup your data always, very important. They are bad. Let's think about how frequently we backup our data daily in extreme cases every few hours this means our rpo the amount of data we can lose in case of disaster is hours lots of data then let's think about recovery in case of recovery we're doing our restore from backup operation this is usually also a very long operation very high high rto then let's think about the amount of data we need to transfer in case of disaster. So let's say we back up to a remote object storage. So in case of recovery, we need to read the full backup in order to restore the data. All our data, that's a lot. If we use incremental backup, in that case, we'll, we can use less data, but it will increase our TO, the amount of time of restoration also. Incremental backup requires us to be able to detect incremental changes to the snapshots we took. In, in Kubernetes, there is enhancement to support chain block tracking, CBT, in snapshot, but it's not GA yet. Let's think about Kubernetes resources. Backup a point in time, which means we may lose some resources state or changes, but do we have to? They don't change that frequently. We can do it synchronously, or maybe in a declarative source, like a GitOps. In that case, we can even get to RPO zero, meaning we won't lose any data in case of disaster. We have the exact resources we had in the primary cluster. Luckily for us, storage system do have your application built in. Usually, it's based on periodic snapshots, and only that only transfer the incremental snapshot, the delta change between the period in that period. That, that will allow us lower RPO. And they also have much more efficient uh, storage traffic and separate between the storage traffic and the user IO. And recovery is almost instantly or very close because we already have the latest data in our recovery site. So the RTO from storage perspective is very, very low. So the system has its own API, its own configuration, its own flow, and quite lots of complexity of the system that are using the Geo application. So what we desire 
is more standard API. The idea is that we want an API that will allow us to set up the replication relationship between the two clusters and allow us to manage the application state and also in a, in, can support vendor specific management. What we did in Ceph CSI, we extended the standard CSI API and added a new resource, volume application. Volume, when we create a volume application, we basically enable replication for that volume between the two clusters. When we delete the resource, we disable the replication. We have the replication state, meaning if the volume is primary or not. In this case, um, the volume is primary in east, of our primary site, and is active and multiple in east and replicated to best. The data source will point to the PVC that is being replicated. We have a new CSI SAT car that is handling the reconciliation of those resources. This is an example of the CSI. In order to enhance more capabilities, we also added volume application class. The class contains secrets we need in order to do the storage system to be able to communicate. We can define a replication schedule as not all application and need the same schedule. Some have, you don't change the data much and we can have higher, longer periods. And of course, to store all the vendor specific parameters needed for the storage application. So how will recovery look? So we already have a volume replication created in cluster East and we Define uh, that PV as primary in cluster is. Now we, we know cluster is failed. We want to recover the cluster waste. We'll create a new volume application resource in cluster waste. Mark this replication state in primary. Use the same data source, the same PVC as we did in cluster is. The sidecar will detect the change and use gRPC command and to communicate with the CSI that will modify the storage and will force promote and cluster web PV, making it writable and primary. We locate on the other we require changes on both cluster. So there is a application set we need to change the secondary in cluster west and to primary in cluster east. And again, uh, the sidecar will, in both sides, will do the consolidation, and then the drivers in both sides will apply the needed changes. Are we done? Well, this will work great if the PVC is statically provisioned. But what about dynamic provisioning? So here we have a problem. The, if the PVC are provisioned dynamically, when we want to um, recover, for example, we need to attach the PVC not to a new dynamically provision PV and PVC, but to, to an existing PV, the replicated one. So we are actually create a matching PV in cluster West that is connected to the volume that we replicate to cluster West. Then when we recover, we want use uh, this the data source. Um, but we need a way to, def to tell Kubernetes we want to use the existing PV. So we want to connect between the, the PV and the dynamically provisioned PVC. So now we won't do a dynamic provisioning but static. We connect the PVC to the, rep the PV that, that is connected to the replicated volume. If we talk about, about relocate, that will require also um, changing both the volume application on both sides. We are using a volume handle a cross storage system to identify those PV. Um, it works well for us since we have CSI, but it may be a problem to other CSI or storage systems. And we need to standardize those. 
Now let's go to Sam, who will give you more detail about multi-cluster manager. Okay. Thanks, Orit. Uh, let's talk about multi-cluster management. So we've seen that disaster recovery requires multiple clusters, <clears throat> peer clusters, uh, so that workloads can be recovered or relocated across each other, which basically means we need clusters that are configured equivalent so that the applications can run across these clusters. We also need that any custom resources that these applications use, their operators and custom resources are deployed on both clusters or all clusters. Uh, and we've also looked at storage. The storage has to be set up across these clusters <clears throat> in an equivalent fashion, such that uh, the volume replication class, the storage class, uh, everything is equal and that the application can be redeployed onto a target cluster. So from a cross cluster action perspective, cluster configuration is something that we want uh, to maintain across these clusters. From a user perspective for uh, application recovery and relocation, users would need uh, access to congruent namespaces in these clusters where they can place their workloads. They would also need a declarative copy of their resources, uh, the application manifests that they can uh, recreate on these clusters. And finally, they would need to reroute their uh, global traffic manager or the inbound traffic to uh, the cluster that's actually running their workload uh, at any given instant. Uh, further than this, across these clusters, we also need a level of health monitoring uh, for alerting when a cluster is available or unavailable for various reasons. And finally, to do the recovery relocation orchestration, uh, which is a cross-cluster action, uh, we need to manage multiple Kubernetes clusters. We chose the Open Cluster Management Project, which, as the tagline goes, is a community-driven project focused on multi-cluster and multi-cloud scenarios for Kubernetes apps works perfectly for us. We are looking at multi-cluster and managing apps across multiple clusters. They provide a cluster registry, distribution of work across clusters in the registry, placement of content in a vendor neutral API manner, which again is useful for uh, wider adoption. We leverage uh, open cluster management primarily uh, for the cluster configuration and more importantly, to manage the application lifecycle. So we need uh, application manifests coming from a declarative source and OCM uh, has a channel CRD, which is basically pointing to a Git helm or an object store for the uh, declarative copy of the application manifests. Uh, OCM also has a placement rule uh, CRD, which decides where an application, which clusters an application should be placed to. And so that's leveraged uh, so that we can do the orchestration during disaster recovery by, by uh, scheduling the placement rule appropriately. There are gaps. Uh, disaster recovery orchestration is not a part of it. They are more around uh, stateless apps, uh, which is where we come in and we'll talk about what we're gonna do about that. So for disaster recovery orchestration, uh, although we have these various components, what does it mean for a user and how easy or complex is it? So as it stands, it actually becomes quite complex as we look at three use cases of deploy, uh, relocate, and recover. Let's start at deploy. So for example, the user would have to deploy their application resources to a cluster, let's say east in this particular example. They'd have to create volume replication resources as primary to establish volume replication for every PVC in this particular namespace. They would have to ensure that the volume replication is uh, occurring before uh, they decide to back up the PV cluster data, because that's what's going to be used in the alternate cluster, as Orit mentioned, to reattach to the volume uh, in the storage backend. And finally, if there's a new PVC that's created by uh, the application in the namespace, uh, they'll have to repeat the protection uh, for that particular PVC. Not too bad, uh, but let's go to recover and see how it starts increasing in complexity. So in the event that the East cluster goes down, the user would have to first recover the workload on West, uh, and hence have to restore the PV cluster data first, so that the PVCs that are uh, part of the application manifests as they are restored, reattached to the respective PVs. And then they would have to create the volume replication resource to mark these uh, against these PVs so that they can be marked primary and they're ready for use on the West cluster. Technically, at the, at the point uh, that we've covered these steps, the RTO goal is met. We have recovered the application in some time, uh, but it doesn't end there. 
when East cluster recovers, uh, in this particular case, East is temporarily offline, let's say, we would have to ensure that the application resources in East are deleted. The volume replication resource is marked as secondary so that it starts resyncing data from the new primary on West. And then once resync is established, we can delete the volume replication resource, uh, which would in turn delete the PVC resource and free up uh, East cluster. And of course, once this happens, as is usual, we're going to have to protect any new PVCs that appear on West as part of the application's namespace. Relocate in increases the complexity because we need to uh, ensure first we undeploy or uh, you know uh, remove the application from the West cluster, for which we need to make sure uh, we delete the application resources on West. Uh, we need to ensure the VR volume replication is marked as secondary. We need to wait for the final sync of data to be reported by volume replication resource because uh, relocate is when both clusters are active and recovery point objective is zero. In other words, we need all the data. And once the final resync is complete, is detected, we can get rid of the volume replication resource, etc., on the West cluster. Uh, but then we can start bringing up the application on the East cluster, restoring the PVs first, recreating the apps, recreating volume replication as primary. So there are quite a few steps uh, to perform these uh, actions. And so uh, what we did next was to create a DR orchestrator called Ramen. What Ramen does as per its tagline is instant cloud native workload recovery and relocation across Kubernetes clusters. Yes, we are interested in recovery and relocation across Kube clusters. That's the use case we talked about, and that's what Ramen helps us with. Ramen basically enhances uh, the OCM uh, placement rule uh, scheduler by adding its own scheduler so that it can orchestrate workload placement <clears throat> in the uh, OCM control plane. It further also provides for label selectors for uh, PVCs that need protection and auto creates volume replication relationships for those PVCs as primary or secondary and manages the replication state. Uh, so that users do not have to worry about dynamically created uh, uh, PVCs, for example, when stateful sets, sets are in use. So uh, Ramen provides uh, two APIs, the first one being a DR policy API, which is a cluster scoped resource, uh, which talks about which pair of clusters are in a DR relationship so that we know that the cluster configuration is equal and storage is set up as needed across these two peer clusters. It defines a replication schedule, which basically defines a recovery point objective for the uh, for the application that wants to use this particular policy. And it optionally has a volume replication class selector to disambiguate in case there are multiple volume replication classes with the same schedule on the on the clusters. The DR policy object is a cluster scoped object set up by the administrator. And then the next API, which is the DR placement control API, is per application and the namespaced resource which basically helps control the placement and orchestration of an application across these clusters. So it reconciles the placement rule that's referenced by spec placement ref in the DR policy uh, placement control uh, uh, API. It uh, refers to the DR policy so that it knows what the scheduling interval is and or which clusters this workload can be placed on. It auto protects PVCs based on the PVC selector that's provided in its uh, definition and its spec. And it provides for two actions, uh, a recovery action or a failover action, which fa moves the workload to the failover cluster, and a relocate action, which relocates the workload to the preferred cluster. Initially, a preferred cluster could be specified if a particular region is desired for an application uh, or left empty and dynamically uh, scheduled on, on either cluster in the, in the referred to in the policy, uh, their policy reference. So just this DR placement control API, we could relocate or recover uh, an application, and we'll soon see a demo of that. But before we go there, uh, how is Ramen deployed on these various clusters? So Ramen has two operators. One of the operators is uh, running on the OCM hub cluster, which is the multi-cluster orchestration plane, uh, where the DR policy and the DR placement control objects are created. Uh, its responsibility is obviously to reconcile the DR placement control object. On the managed clusters where the workloads will be running, there is an additional volume replication group API resource that is present and managed by the Ramen cluster operator. We're not going into that because it's auto-managed by Ramen. 
but volume replication group api is the one that helps detect uh new PDCs that are created and or when PDCs are no longer in use so that a final sync is initiated with the volume replication. And you know all in-cluster activities are managed by the volume replication group API, which is controlled by the DR placement control API at the hub. So with that, uh, let's go into a quick demo. What we have here is a demonstration of how we control relocation based on DR placement control. Uh, we have three clusters, East, West, and the Hub cluster. The Hub cluster being the Raman Hub, East and West being two managed clusters where applications would be deployed to. What we've actually done is we've already deployed the application on the East cluster. The application that's been deployed is a BusyBox pod in the BusyBox sample namespace. It very simply echoes the current timestamp to a file every 10 seconds. And uh, the file is actually an amount point, which is backed by a PVC, which is backed by Ceph RBD, which is set up across East and West for storage replication. We deployed this, so obviously the DR placement control on the hub is responsible for uh, having deployed this particular resource. Uh, let's take a look at that. Um, it basically has a DR policy, which is the policy has East and West clusters in it. It is gonna reconcile the BusyBox placement, placement rule. And finally, it has a preferred cluster mentioned in it, which, which tells it which cluster to prefer, and it was east, and that's why it's deployed it on east. And it's already set up volume replication and other such requirements for the PVC in use, uh, and the user doesn't have to worry about those things. Now, as uh, we are writing timestamps to the file, and we want to demonstrate recovery, let's take a look, let's tail the uh, pod, BusyBox pod, so that we know the timestamps. As we come back to the hub, to uh, perform uh, recovery to the West cluster. And we'll see what kind of data loss we uh, encountered. So to perform a recovery of the uh, workload on the West cluster, we need to edit the DR placement control. And we need to provide it with an action of uh, uh, failover. And we'll need to give it a failover cluster. And that failover cluster in this particular case would be West, so that the workload can move from east to west without any coordination. It assumes east is down, although east is really not down in the example. So now that we've committed that, Ram and started moving it, We're watching for the busy box pod on west. And once that comes into running state, we'll take a look at the data. Speeding up, we see the last series of timestamps that have been dropped on the east cluster, which is what we'll compare with the west cluster. And on the west cluster, we see that the pod is already running. So let's uh, take a look at the data within the pod and see what data we lost because this was a recovery operation, a failover operation that we performed. So looking at out file here, we see that uh, on east, we actually wrote 3755 timestamp and a series of 38 timestamps and a 39 timestamp. And uh, so on the, um, on the west cluster, we look at, uh, what what the timestamps are uh, and how much of uh, data did we lose. So if you look at it here, we got the 3755 timestamp. We lost the series of 38s and a 139, which was about a minute worth of data that lost that was lost. The replication schedule that we've actually set up for this demo is one minute. So it lost about a minute of data from East. It recovered, <clears throat> it started running again at 39.13, so the recovery time was approximately a minute and 20 seconds, give or take. And how did we achieve this? We basically uh, edited the DR placement control for an action of failover and gave it a failover cluster and let the entire orchestration happen for that same. The uh, next uh, part of the demo, we're gonna do a relocate where we're gonna show zero data loss, so let's, start tailing the busy box pod on the west cluster and in this particular case we're just going to uh, see that there is zero data loss so we need all timestamps back on east once we relocate it and to relocate it we go ahead we edit the dr placement control object again this time around we change the action instead of a failover we're going to say relocate we already have a preferred cluster of east down there so it's just going to relocate to the east cluster Failover cluster is still in there, but that's immaterial uh, because it's not going to be used for this purpose. 
So moving on, watching for the pod on the east cluster, which is where it's getting relocated to. Still tail the logs uh, on the west cluster to make sure all timestamps made it. After some time, we find that the pod is running on the east cluster. So uh, what we're really looking for is the 4309 timestamp should still be present on the east cluster to ensure RPO of zero. So let's cap the logs, uh, sorry, cap the content of the volume in the East cluster and take a look at the timestamps. So we were looking at 4309 and on the East cluster, we have 4309 uh, timestamp present. And if you look at it, the next timestamp is 4439. So it took about a minute and 30 seconds, which is your RTO. Although this is not purely recovery, uh, but there is an application downtime during relocation. And how did we do this? Uh, again, we just edited the uh, DR placement control, changed the action to relocate. Uh, it had a preferred cluster and moved over there. So DR placement control basically simplifies, it's the tip of the iceberg, simplifies the complexity of the remaining parts of the stack that we are using, volume replication, storage, application management with OCM, and provides an easy to use interface to actually orchestrate uh, relocation and recovery. Let's look at uh, uh, future work in this area. <clears throat> so what do we want to do next? Uh, we talked about regional DR. That is the Metro DR case where storage, uh, the assumption is uh, storage replication is synchronous. So there is no uh, data loss. There is RPO uh, is zero. Uh, but we would still need to recover and relocate applications across these clusters. And we might want to tackle storage fencing when we know that a particular cluster is unavailable because it may still be accessing storage and we do not want uh, multiple writers to the same storage endpoint corrupting the data. So that would be an interesting use case to tackle with a same or a similar stack. Uh, upstream data protection working group, uh, SIG has actually provided uh, any volume data source feature gate, which allows a PVC to be created by an arbitrary kind in the Kubernetes cluster. We would want to leverage that so that we can use volume replication as a kind to create a volume, uh, to create a PVC from, which can help us move away from uh, copying PV across uh, and static provisioning and assuming that the PVs, uh, CSI handle, a volume handle across storage vendors, across clusters can be reused uh, in the same fashion. From a replication consistency perspective, uh, the storage replication is based on storage snapshots and hence it is crash consistent. It's not necessarily application consistent. There's work going on in the data, DP, uh, data protection uh, SIG for application consistent snapshots. We need to integrate or leverage that to provide application consistent replication snapshots so that they replicate it as required. To further improve consistency, uh, applications do not always use uh, single PVCs. They have a group of PVCs. Again, there is work going on around volume groups and volume group snapshots uh, in the data protection SIG. And when that becomes a reality, uh, the, the replication uh, of this, these set of PVCs will also be point in time consistent across each other, providing better resilience and recovery for the application on the target clusters. We'd also want to move towards more data agnostic replication mechanisms. For example, proposals like the change block tracking uh, can help reduce RPO and transfer data across uh, various storage systems. They do not have to be in the same storage system. So that can make us storage agnostic and address RPOs instead of backups. Using backups, address RPOs using change blocks across snapshots. I would also look at uh, providing more arbitrary replication scheme than volume replication so that uh, data can be transferred across uh, peer clusters and the storage systems probably don't have to be the same. It kind of provides for a hybrid approach in the future. And with that, uh, here are some links and references uh, for the various components that we talked about in this presentation and used to build up uh, RAM and uh, volume replication. Uh, please do take a look, uh, participate as the case may be. And uh, thank you. That ends our presentation. And we are open for any questions that you may have.